Okay, so we'll start starting slowly together over here. Uh, just another service information before we kick off. Please remember to leave the beacons on the front door before you leave the conference for good. If that's today, leave them today. If that's tomorrow, just bring them with you uh, to your home and then leave them here tomorrow. Ivan Tončić is our next speaker. Today he is full stack developer from FIS Global. And in the next 25 minutes, he will present on a very interesting subject. So after the talk, please uh, visit even over there at FIS Global booth for Q&A. So the Q&A again will not be held here at this stage. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Ivan Tončić. I'm software developer in the research and development team called Strategy Enablement based out of Belgrade in FIS. We are part of a larger group inside FIS called Cross Asset Trading and Risk. So the best thing I like about my job is being able to go through existing solutions and components and try to find the way and explore new technologies. But let me say a few, a few words about FIS. You may have already heard about us. As we say often, we empower the financial world. We are one of the market leaders or market leading company in providing fintech solutions in both commercial and investment banking space. We have hundreds of clients across the world and we have a very large family of existing products and components that have been present on the market and are highly established. We have high profile clients that come from the biggest investment banks in the world to big and small hedge funds around the world. One of the biggest hedge funds deals were written just this year. As I said, there are many products that FIS offers in the commercial and investment banking space. Some of them are in front of you. So, although when you have existing products and you are a market leader, you always seek out new opportunities, how to improve the experience, the performance, the revenue. So our topic today will be what can we do next? Where we are currently is just fine, but how can we improve that? I have been back in developer for most of my life, so a valid question would be what am I doing in a user experience presentation? But once a colleague of mine told me, processing is one thing, but GUI is everything. I could never agree with that fully, but it is important what you deliver to the customer, how he sees the application in front of him, how he interacts with it. So it's crucial thing, how can you improve that? With a large family of products, you have different user experiences and user interface is often mixed with user interface. So user interface is one thing, it's styling, it's presentation. User experience is the way the users interact with the applications. You can have similar styles, but completely different user experience. That can bring confusion and frustration to customers. So I won't be talking purely for, from a scientific base, this is what we have established and discovered while trying to overcome those problems. What we try to achieve now is common, unified user experience across family of products and joining them into a single platform that would make user feel like he's using only one product with all the features needed. So let's look at again of the present and where we want to be and what are the potential problems. So in the place where we are with many customers and many development centers behind us, we have highly optimized, mature, proven models in processing and storing data. Of course, that is a fantastic starting point. You want to leverage as much of this as you want, whatever you do next. But what are the potential problems and current problems 
that we are facing now, and we identify them in conquering market even more so than we are now. So usually, to cover the entire business process in the financial industry, customers are, to say so, forced to use many different products and use them together in order to cover the entire business flow they're running, to cover all their business needs in, the, in their processes, they have to use multiple products. So there's always an issue of interface between them, transforming data, transforming models, hosting those. You are all well familiar with those problems. How do you migrate? How do you map models, etc.? The research delivered the results that the total cost of ownership sometimes can be too expensive. So, as I said, we have diverse clients, top-tier banks in investment banking space with several hundreds of billions in assets. For those guys, it's not a problem to spare a couple of million of dollars on the infrastructure. But if you're trying to start up a hedge fund with hundred million dollars, you wouldn't waste a million or two million on hosted solution. So we wanted to approach those customers also. And we have identified the gap in the market. And our goal now is to overcome that and be a player on that part of market also. So what is the total cost of ownership? You have the software. It has its licenses, its price. But that's not the end of story. You have to host that. You have to maintain that. The guys from your IT department have to install it. Story all this time, we all know about it. When it comes to deployment of such system, it's time consuming. The clients we're dealing with have very sophisticated and complex business logic. Mathematical models in financial industries are one of the complex in the world. So in order to configure that, to consolidate all the needs of a customer in one installation, it can be time consuming and time is money, so that's also expensive. On the other hand, we realize that the pricing itself, the licensing, is not structured enough. Meaning that sometimes we are aware that maybe for the components chosen and the delivery chosen, client can be severely charged. It's the rules as they are, but we now want to track and price the usage per request count or per component usage. That's our next goal. So our vision in delivering that is trying to unify the existing family of products and components. But we want to do more than that. We want to expose them both to end users and developers. Now that is a tricky part. When you think of selling a software to an end customer, to the end user, you always think, have to think the, uh, about the entire vertical slice, from the database to transformation, server processing, calculation models, data models, and then on top of it, the user interface and user experience. But sometimes customers desire the way of usage that you simply have not envisioned. They require additional customization hours, which, bring, which brings pain to your already overbooked stack of tasks you have to deal with. So one way to avoid this is to expose all your digital assets to the developers through the API and publicly facing API. So when we're talking now about single platform that unifies everything, we're both targeting the end users, customers in the office, traders, brokers, all the operation guys and the developers that they have internally that could query and connect with our API. On top of it, we want to offer a default unified user interface that is a starting point where users can see what are they getting. So let's dig into more details of current solutions. I'm trying to bother you with details as least as possible but it simply has to be said. So common components in current solutions present on the market that deal with risk and 
trading processing are in front of you. Each of these components have class model and data model. Some of them are shared, some of them are completely independent. The code and the knowledge that's present in those components has been acquired over a long period of time and cannot be easily rewritten or replicated. When I was talking about cost of total cost of ownership, this is what I was referring to. So for each of the areas in the investment banking space, you have to assemble an appropriate package or installation that you want to deliver to the customer. Once you're done with that, you have to maintain it on an on-site hosting, and the common infrastructure cannot be shared. We've migrated to better options with hosted cloud solutions, but that is only a halfway through. So, when starting to build the unified UX platform, you have to start off with building a backend that will supply all the necessary data and that will respond to all the processing requests made from the front end. Again, we know that we have existing core components here that we need to leverage as much as possible. Those core, core components have the functionalities and libraries that are working and they're working well. So you don't want to just dispose them, try to rewrite them. It's a then dangerous and risky approach. I've seen many products break at the point when they try to rewrite a multi-decade working backend. And they got stuck with doing the processing in the web layer, all the different stuff that made their product never to relive and live to the new generation. So what we took from that experience and from the existing products is that on top of all the components, we have built a workflow and task-based processing layer. Task is basically a, a unit of execution that you can all imagine what does it do. It simply invokes and communicates with core components and accesses all the functionalities that it needs in order to complete the task itself. Tasks are further grouped into the workflows. So <clears throat> at this point in time, you can design the workflows and tasks as a recombination of existing features without changing the core components. That is the first big advantage of this approach. Secondly, of course, you want to communicate with the outer world. We have done this through a messaging layer, which is also doing the translation of, of all the requests and responses. Here, we have adopted a microservice-based architecture with common message bus, as you all usually do in such solutions. Now, the benefit of this layer is that you extend the existing functionality by simply introducing new messages, new formats, or new contents. So if you want to extend the functionality on your platform seen from the outer world, you have to extend the message definitions, and then those definitions can call existing or newly built tasks. Of course, it may happen that something is not present in core components. Then you would have, all, of course, to do some development there. But if you think about it, the feature that was not supported in the core was definitely something that was missing from the core components. So eventually, you would get to it and get it done because someone would see it as an error in an existing product. Now that we have the messaging layer ready and flexible enough, we want to communicate to the outer world. So we've implemented two technologies here, a web socket communication based on Google protocol buffers, which offer variant compressions 
in the data communication and are highly efficient in delivering millions of records in and out. In the banking industry, you can have those in real cases and real life scenarios. The other approach is, of course, the request response that we've built separately and on top of the WebSocket layer. We have leveraged the old data protocol due to all the advantages that it's offering when it comes to communicating with our API and exposing the API. All data has very specific, very detailed definition of all the endpoints when it comes to models that you have to define when you communicate with them and out of the box client builders that could communicate with your API. At this point in time, we had the basic API overlay which, ha which has completely covered the core components, hidden core components from the outer world. But in real life enterprise level API, you need additional things. When it comes to the platform that's going to face the developers and end users, you need to have the authentication, the load balancing, monitoring, licensing, all the important stuff. For these purposes, we have leveraged the WVSO2 API management platform, publisher, and store. So what do they offer? Since we already had the old data implemented, we have done an automatic translator to the Swagger definition that's acceptable by WVSO2 API management platform. Once our internal API was exposed and consumed, by WSO2. Inside the WSO2, we have defined the licensing, subscriptions, and limitations per request or per user or per component. So, additional to that, as I said, WSO2 offers load balancing feature if you want to proxy several servers on the back end. They're all hidden and covered by WVSO2. There's another interesting concept in VSO2, and that is the application. And that was one of the reasons that we decided to go with WVSO2. So, what is application in the WVSO2 world? It's a simply collection of endpoints. And when you think of it, it is a good approach that you can group several different endpoints, expose them as an application, and define licensing and subscriptions toward that application. The store of WSO2 offers end users and customer the ability to browse and look all the applications that you can offer and decide do they want to use them or not. Also, it offers a convenient way to interact and send test data and receive data back. So, with now all of this being in place, we have laid down the groundwork. Now I will switch to the front-end arch architecture. So, we have built upon the in-house proprietary framework called FIS Responsive UI Framework that's built on top of Angular TypeScript and HTML5. Further, we have built a middleware communication layer that would handle all the transformations towards the API-hosted platform. As many of you have most probably assumed so far, one of the trickiest parts in making this happen will be model transformations and model mapping. That always, that's always different because when you have different products, each of them has its own data model, its own world. When you want to join them together, some things are similar, some things are overlapping, and some things are completely different. How do you unify the models? That's the most complicated thing. So the API communication middleware provides a set of predefined adapters that you can additionally customize in order to communicate with the endpoints that have been exposed. Offers you the ability to further customize the 
data that's been fed or requests that have been received from the front end. So who is communicating with that middleware? Those are, of course, services that are already aware of the resources they want to use and leverage. The metadata is defined here, and they accept the requests for processing from widgets visible by user and also deliver the data back to them. The transformation and customization of this solution can be provided at any given point. So, in real life, this is the global overview. The point is these are all real-life products and real-life parts of the systems. And on the top line, you can see all the main beneficials from this integrated platform. Of course, we're striving for being as stateless as possible because then you can scale your pricing on main hardware providers and providers in the world, such as Elastic Cloud and Amazon. Also, the VSO2, double VSO2 has been also leveraged and is exposing all the parts and products from the FIS in both commercial banking and investment banking through the public API platform call, called FIS Code Connect. So, I'll just give you a small preview and glance of how does it look like in reality. Of course, with users wanting to group and dissect data from different sources, track them in parallel, issue requests. We have allowed, of course, a infrastructure based on tabs and workspaces with docking panels and all the other layout management cool stuff. Of course, when it comes to presentation of this data, we have leveraged different presentation level components, charts in all the forms. I guess we all love charts somehow and for some reason. So let us summarize. What are the technologies that have been mentioned here? You already seen them. I don't need to repeat that. But the main question here is, is this just a theory or reality? And the point is that this is what we've actually tested, tried out, and put through some initial use cases and processing verifications. And all of the technologies and approaches that I've shown, we have adopted and they become a part of the development process that we'll use in building next generation trading systems. Thank you all.